That's better. Okay. Well, they started doing something else without the follow up. The September meeting of the Back Bay Amateur Astronomers will now come to order. Okay, we'll start off with our reports as we usually do, and we'll start off with the Vice President and the schedule. What's coming up? Great, thank you. I, I want everybody to know I put on a last minute comet watch, and I'll show you right now, for early in the morning, in other words, Friday morning early. Ah, uh, what happened? I had it. Go to share screen. There it is. Okay, yeah, I got to I got to put it on there first. Now I can share it. Share, share, share. Okay, here we go. All right, can everybody see the September schedule? Yeah. All right. Uh, today is the club meeting. Now, early in the morning at four forty-five, I actually would make it four thirty in the morning. Comet watch for uh, name of the comet Nish Nishimiti or whatever the heck his name is. Uh, Nishimura uh, Comet, and it's uh, I think it's every 30,000 years it returns, something like that. So it's it's, it's, it next time. it's periodic, but, <laughs> but uh, I wanted to see it. I, we, we're going to have some reports, I'm sure, that uh, some other people in the club have already seen it, but I haven't seen it. So uh, if you want to take if you want to give it a try, the clouds are supposed to be good, the transparency is supposed to be fair tonight at the Marsh Causeway which is, I don't see it on here, but uh, anyway, Marsh Causeway, Knott's Island. Okay, and uh, I can- Go down Sand, Yeah, Princess Anne, yeah. Princess Anne, yeah. And you don't make any turns, you can go to North Carolina, you don't make any turns, and, and as soon as you get to the small bridge, it's a half a mile past that. So uh, I've got the thing on here. Oh, the location went away. So I, anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll fix that. It's 601 Marsh Causeway in uh, Knott's Island. How did it let me get away with it without having an address? But I'll, I'll fix that. So if you're interested, I'm going to go to that uh, late or early this morning. And I hope maybe some of you other, other guys will too. Uh, I'm going to bring big four-inch binoculars. So we should be able to see it through that. Oh, very good too. Uh, six magnitude. Is that anybody know how how bright? I know what you've seen in binoculars. Yeah. Oh, does it have a tail? Any tail? I haven't heard a report of the tail. Now, Sean Sean's seen it, so he'll he'll. No, I haven't seen it. Oh, I thought you. Oh, you, I tried to see it. Oh, you I tried to see it. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, we got another shot here uh, early in the morning uh, after midnight tonight. No ghost on. And then Skywatch on uh, Northwest River Park on the night on Saturday. Uh, it, by the way, the comet is a morning comet, so you have to catch it before sunrise. Okay, I, I skipped the Navy camp out. I'm signed up for this. I'm the only one that signed up for the Navy camp out. I'll be there. I well, just forget the sign. Okay, you just, okay, just George and I'll be there. I'm but, be and and Sean's going to be there. So we need some more uh, volunteers for that. Where is that at? Where is it? It Fort is Fort Story Campground. Fort Story, Story Campground. So need a military ID. Or uh, dependent ID to get on there. Okay, I I can maybe I can do something at the gate, help everybody, huh? What's it called again? Uh, it's a a Navy, 2023 Navy Camp Out and Stars. No, I mean the location. Oh, Fort Story, <laughs> Fort Story, um, and then base. What? The joint expeditionary base. Is that the Little Creek base? Is that the one? The joint. The same one. Well, let me look. Let me look. Fort Story Campground, 601 Atlantic Avenue, okay? 9 to 1030. So I don't know how the weather is going to be on that. Weather is supposed to be good this morning for the comet. If you go to the Night Sky Network here and scroll, like if just scroll down to the bottom, you can show them the map. Right. All of our events have a, where you get directions to it. Mm-hmm. I think it's a little further down. Well, then, if there was a yeah, right get with, directions. Get directions. So you put in your starting address, and then you put that in, and then it it zooms in and fourth story up up by the lighthouse. I don't know exactly where it is, but um, off Atlantic Avenue. Okay. 
And excuse me, are you saying that we we definitely need a military ID or can we somehow get on if we if we just are there and we if, let you know we're coming? If you sign up an RSVP, I will give the guard, the gate guard at the at the front, uh, you know, the gate guard, the list. Yes. Is so that Sandy? Is that Sandy? Yes, yes okay. that's Sandy. I'm sorry. Yes. The place you were a couple years ago. Remember? Oh, yes, I know exactly where I but I did I don't have a military ID. That's what I was okay. asking. So. Well, you, you guys sign up and I'll make sure you get in, okay? All right, thank you. Check. All right. What we got next? Navy Camps uh Skywatch is it's a real good event. Lots of public, lots of telescopes, and people really enjoy looking through our scopes, get a lot of wows and OMGs. The next big event, the East Coast East Coast Star Party starting Thursday night. And I won't take too much thunder away from Bruce. He's going to talk more about it tonight. But uh, it runs from Thursday all the way till Sunday morning, is it? Okay. All right. Uh, the public viewing is Saturday, Friday night. Uh, public viewing Friday night. Okay, thanks. Uh, also, there, there's a Star Party public night. Well, that's the same thing at East Coast. Yeah, that's at East Coast. All right. The um, Kempsville, Virginia Rec Center. Astronomy 101 with George, and I always come with my scope. We need some volunteers for that. I didn't check to see how many there were, but we need some volunteers with scopes for that. George gives a dynamite presentation, and we, we usually get a lot of interested people for the scopes. Garden starts Thursday night, 8 o'clock. Question? Okay. Night hike, uh, 7 o'clock, 7 p.m., and that's located at Northwest, Northwest, Northwest River Park also. All right, is that the equestrian area too? Yes. Starts the same place, equestrian area. Saturday, Sunday, then we set up telescopes at the uh, Elizabeth River Park. <laughs> okay, and that's actually, it's uh, Saturday, but we look at the sun, that's why it's Saturday, Sunday. Okay, and then boardwalk astronomy number five should be the last one. Um, on the 25th, always a lot of fun. Please come and uh, bring your scope and and watch the show, which which is we watch the crowd and the crowd watches the, the scopes. The crowd's pretty interesting there. All right, and that wraps up September. Let's look at October. October is going to be really clobbered with lots of events. Uh, club meeting Thursday, Croatan stargazing. We reschedule it. This is the third or fourth time we reschedule it for Friday, 8:30. Skywatch North Res Whit River Park on the 7th. Fantastic Planet at ODU uh, and Inflate Fest uh, is a little bit of a conflict. What's Inflate Fest? What, where's that at? Let's, let me look. That's, the, that's part of the That's uh, part of the thing, thing too. Thing. Okay. Right when they inflate the balloon that got it. Hang between no, the this buildings. year it's not Mars Fest or the Moon thing, it's Inflate, inflate Fest. Inflate Fest, I see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, every year they have a different theme. And then uh, coincidentally, uh the on the 14th is the solar the partial solar eclipse annular. annular it's a partial annular so we get a <laughs> get to see the, the sun with a little bite taken out from the moon so go back to october there so you can show them. oh i, I was yeah. looking i thought i was looking at it but i'm not yeah because we're doing three events across the area for that we sure are make sure everybody knows all <laughs> right so on the 13th 14th and 15th starts the that's at the Barry Art Museum, that's on uh, North Ham uh, Hampton Boulevard. Okay, parking's going to be hard, and um, uh, not not impossible, but difficult. So if, if you come early, then you can park in the yeah, parking garage. Yeah, unload your scope and park in the parking garage. It's not too bad, and the police will try to say, "No, you can't park there." Well, I'm just unloading my telescope, and they'll do they'll let you do that and park someplace else. Okay, back. In, and I have to keep going to October because I forget. All right, and then this annular solar eclipse um, party starts at eleven. Um, that's gonna that's the start of it, but I think the eclipse is is actually more like twelve thirty or something like that. Okay, there's five more events on that, so let's look and see what other events we're talking about here. Fantastic Planet, the Arts Festival at ODU Day Two, annual solar eclipse, thirty one percent obscured. And we canceled the annular eclipse party. Somebody had requested that. We couldn't do two 
eclipse parties and have all these events at the same time. Night Watch at Chip Ox, uh Plantation State Park is also uh, a conflict. So it's plenty of things to do in October. All right. Where are so we going to go? be Newport News that one said, I think, uh, Rich, aren't you going to do something at Carrollton Library that day? Is that right? I could. Okay. I'm not, and if Sam, you know about it, then that's not what we're doing. Sam Bartholomew <laughs> and I, Sam, Sam, raise your hand so everybody knows who you are. Okay. Sam Bartholomew and I are going to are going to uh, be at the, um, we're going to try to lead the thing at, at uh, where the heck's the, net, the, the library? Uh, Newport News, right? Yeah. Newport News Library. Okay, so you guys are going to Newport News. Yeah, if, if uh, Carrollton Library, I was planning on going to Newport News, but if Carrollton Library asks or uh, requests a uh, event, I can definitely go there. It's a lot closer. So right. I okay. spoke about that. I know we're doing three. Yeah. We're doing it at the Chesapeake Planetarium. That's right. Where Chesapeake's the third, the third one. one. North uh, Newport News, Chesapeake, and ODU. That's the third one. What are those? Uh-huh. Okay. Fantastic planet, see? But that's during the day, you know. Okay, where are we in October? Here we go. Uh, in Flake Fest, we talked about Kempsville Rec Center Astro Number Six. It starts at seven thirty. Uh, that's a fun event. Garden Stars, the nineteenth, another fun event. And how's your turnout, George? Are you getting lots of people uh, volunteering? Yeah, we're averaging uh, well, it's, it, we're getting about twenty people uh, and two or three volunteers. Great. Right. Yeah. Great. So it's it's a lot of fun. The public really enjoys us coming out, and and we love showing them our our scopes and. Uh, they always say, how much does that scope cost and all that? When I won't digress any further. Okay, what is this? <laughs> Churchland Primary Spook Science. Uh, I think I scheduled that one and I forgot what it is. So I got to look at it. Uh, the Churchland Primary School, 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. Uh, in Portsmouth, Virginia. And they want to do a spook science Halloween theme kind of thing. So that'll be a fun activity. Go back to October. All right, uh, and then where are we? Uh, Saturday, Sunday, again, the 28th. And we got Kempsville Rec Center again, one time Wednesday before the club meeting, and then that's the November club meeting. Are there any questions? Yeah, go back. Yes. The, uh, Crow Attain, did you mention Crow Attain? I did. Uh, okay. where, which one is it? That's the, uh, it's the fourth rescheduling of Crow Attain. Yeah, I, I mentioned that too. Yeah, you, you had it there. Oh, I did? October, October the 6th. Oh, okay. Yeah, there it October is. October the sixth. Yeah. And I uh, originally I was asked to by somebody in my church who lives in Croatan to let them know when we're going to be there. So I hope we're going to be there. <laughs> I'm not going to be there. I'm going to be out in uh, upstate New York that weekend. I've been messaging yeah, messaging with uh, who is the lady here, uh, Amanda, and she said parking's a little bit limited for us folks. So uh, we're going to try to park as many cars as we can in our driveway, and that's all we got. That's where we park, in yeah. the driveway. So we, we can't have too many volunteers, or you won't be able to park anywhere. All right. Questions on that or anything else? So um, I don't want to overload October, but uh, Stunt River Star Party is October 10th through the 14th. Right. We mentioned that, didn't we? Stanton River. Yeah. Oh, Stanton no, River we didn't Star mention that. It's not on our Stanton calendar. Stanton River Star Party, actually, the 9th through the 15th. The 9th through the 15th. Okay, yes. so it overlaps us a little bit, huh? Yeah, I'm not going this time. Okay, is anybody going to that? I'm, I'm going. Okay. You're going to get some feedback and steal some of their ideas? Yes, I am. Good. Good. Plagiarism is always a good thing. We want to make sure not to have the same mistakes that the other folks do. Okay. Anybody else for September, October activities? All right. If you're going to come uh, this morning to the uh, Comet Watch, please bring plenty of bug spray. Okay, thank you, Jeff. Uh, I count 23 people here, but there was only 20 names on the list. So somebody hasn't signed in. So if you haven't signed in, please come sign in the, on the on the form there. Okay, time for the treasurer's report. Rich, it's all yours. Well, we don't have to dispense with not doing the secretary report first. He's all I'm that we dispense. Now, I've got the treasurer's report. 
<laughs> on my list now. Sweet. I like the but we will we will say okay, secretary's report. Secretary's report. I make a motion that we dispense with the secretary report. Hmm. It has been moved that we dispense with the secretary's Nobody report. Is there a right. second? I second. <laughs> it has been moved and seconded that we dispense with the reading of the minutes. All in favor say aye. Right. Yes, the eyes have it. Okay. What about the you can get to the eyes since I already have it pulled up. So, treasures are got books. some G, we got some ends. We got $7,700 in the accounts. That is about $60 less than we had at the beginning of the month. So, you go, oh, only $60 uh, change in the accounts. Not much, much. Not much stuff must have happened, but a lot did. Actually, we brought in a lot of money and spent, a, but we spent a lot of money. So about eight hundred dollars came in, and about eight hundred dollars came out, and we balanced out. Most of that money has to do with East Coast Star Party. I'll bring up the financials on that. So we've been bringing a lot of money in, but we're starting to write some checks um, for East Coast Star Party um, scholarships. You know, minus, but we're pretty well funded. We're set up well for next year. Um, and we have 186 members on the roster. I think that's got to be a record. Um, they keep, keep coming in, you know, every month. So that's awesome. it's strong. Financials are strong. Um, uh, as I said, the most of the activity came around East Coast Star Party. I think we're in a good shape here. So we've had 27 people pay. A couple of these are for more than one person. So Probably got about 30 registered right now. We brought in almost, you know, $2,485. We spent $1,700, most of it on, you know, some prizes, porta potties, um, shirts or got ordered. Um, and so the remaining expenses are paying the park and buying the food for the cookout. We'll probably about break even um, at the end of the day, which is what we were hoping to do. Uh, we weren't really trying to make a lot of money off it. Yes, Bruce. Oh, just a heads up. I thought you're waving like, let me talk, let me talk before you say anything bad and wrong. No, no. I'm I'm just really glad that you know we're uh in the black. Yeah, yeah. We and when we we say okay, we're about to break even because you know after this we weren't there was a lot of discussion early on. You guys may not know this about how to like actually cost it out. And price it, and we are making some assumptions, and most of our assumptions were were pretty good. So our goal was to break even. We're going to break even. Um, it might be a little better, you know, because we were. Then we got to look at the books. Do, do we adjust next year? When we probably won't. We had some cost that are going to affect us this year, but we'll get to reuse stuff, so we can relook at that because we you know, we bought some signs, some solar. Like Sean bought these solar red light things. Um, so then the club's just going to keep them and we will reuse them on future um, star parties. So that's, you know, cost that we won't have to bear in the future that we are faring this time. But all in all, we're looking good. Any questions about the monies? Questions? Do we have a motion to accept the reading or accept the uh, prejudice report? I make a motion to accept the prejudice report. It has been moved. Uh, is there a second? Second. Second, it's been moved and seconded. We accept the treasurer's report. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. <laughs> <laughs> Just so there's one, okay. Okay, the treasurer's report has been accepted. All right. Uh, I'll leave the Alcor report for just a little bit later so we can he can talk a little bit about the East Coast Star Party. How about the scholarship chairman and the RRRT, Ben Loyola? Hey, all. Um, no update on the scholarship, but the funds look really good. Um, I guess the only thing I would uh, preface that is, are we setting up for some type of uh, raffle here and and uh, looking at some other of the other revenue streams besides the boardwalk and uh, donations? So I'm uh, just kind of put that out as a teaser. Um, and uh, I don't have anything on the RRT. Um, if anybody's interested, again, I uh, don't know who's here, new new members. Uh, Sorry, I was I was not going to be able to make it tonight, and uh, but I, I was squeezing the Zoom call. Um, it's over at Fan Mountain, uh, but uh, over three thousand feet, it's a beautiful million dollar telescope that we have access to as a club, 
And if you're interested in using it robotically uh, and able to download uh, simple JPEGs as well as some of the actual uh, files for post-processing, and um, just contact me or contact any of the officers and we'll get you an account. And it's pretty much unlimited usage of a million dollar telescope that's uh, operated by the universities. So that's all I have. Yeah, last month it was under repair or under maintenance. So I'm yeah, not sure to see what's going on. I had something with, with that. Uh, ben brought up a good point about uh, boardwalk astronomy. George, I know you reached out to uh, with Mike Hinton with IMG and, um, about the, the funds. Did he ever respond back? Well, I haven't heard back yet. I'm going to pursue that uh, just for you, everybody's uh, information. We, in the past, have split the funds with Plaza Middle School Planetarium. Uh, it was $250 for each boardwalk astronomy for them, $250 for us, but they are no longer part of it. Uh, Chuck Dibbs is no longer the uh, planetarium director and uh, apparently they're not cooperating or not supporting uh, boardwalk astronomy anymore so I'm I've emailed uh, Mike the guy who runs the beach events uh, I haven't heard back from him but I will con continue to get after him because we should be getting the whole whole amount now. well well George I, well, I think what I'm going to do because last year because we, we had that backlog and Mike said hey as soon as you're done send me the invoice I'm just going to invoice him the whole five hundred dollars per, and see what he says. Okay. Send him the invoice, and then if he wants to, and then we can negotiate from there. Okay. So as soon as we have, I guess the last one's coming up. I'm not sure how many we actually did this year. Let me know, and I'll send it off. I'll send our W nine, and I'll send them all the stuff that they've asked. Two so far, two for sure. If we if we show up on that one with with weather, I showed up on one. The weather was bad. I don't think it's going to count that. Last one, incidentally, as long as we're talking about it, they didn't have anybody to turn the lights off for us, but it was the that's whole season. Yeah, that's the only thing we need to make sure of is yeah. they send someone down. Yeah, was, anyway, we, we had a good, successful uh, boardwalk astronomy last week, last Tuesday, and it was uh, a lot of people, about 300 people, 400, 300, <laughs> something like that. <laughs> it's quite a few. <laughs> and uh, the skies cleared up. The moon was great. We saw Saturn. And just as we were leaving, Jupiter was rising at 11 o'clock. So, uh, yeah, I'll, uh, I'll follow up on that. Okay, uh, let's turn it over to Bruce for the Alcor report. Before, we, before Bruce speaks about the Astronomical League, he uh, sent me an email, some, some of the resources that are available through the Astronomical League. You can download the What's Up for the month of September. You can, uh, it says the moon visits M44, Venus visits M67 on September the 11th. There's uh, stars to look for, Delta CPI, and the mid-month or mid, uh, yeah, the September, astronomical calendar or, or star chart. So those are all available through the Astronomical League. So turn it over to Bruce Powers, our Astronomical League coordinator. Okay, um, so I, I'm gonna share briefly here. Um, hopefully I can get some share going on here. All right, can everybody see this? Yep. Yep. Hold on. What's going on? Why can't I? <laughs> All right. Why am I drawing? Shoot. So, can you see the Astronomical League website at least? Yep. Yep. Oh, I just want to, I don't want to, apparently I'm drawing. Let me change this damn interface again. Not to drive anybody crazy. <laughs> Mouse. Okay. Now, now we're cooking. All right. Can everybody see the Astronomical League website? Yes. Now that I'm no longer drawing on it. I see right. your hand moving around. Okay. So here, here's Mr. Hand. But anyway, um, so <laughs> <the> <laughs> George just mentioned, okay, are all here on the Astronomical League website. So they have actually redesigned this 
It is uh, a much more intuitive design. If you haven't been to uh, astroleague.org in a while, uh, go check it out. Okay. So everything that George just uh, showed there uh, in person, sorry, couldn't be there, is here at the Astro League org site. Okay. Um, so uh, one of the things here on the Astro League site is Reflector Magazine. And I, I looked in uh, the, the paper version that I get. And uh, to my sadness, once again, for the September issue, we have no uh, Back Bay Amateur Astronomers um, uh, listed for awards. I know some people are, are looking for awards, but what, what you get it is, is, is bling. You, you get bling, you get flair, whatever you want to call it, okay? I have six pieces of flair over the years I've been doing this. I, um, I want to challenge all of you to uh, get a piece of bling or flair from the Astronomical League. Well, how do you do that? Well, you do observing programs. So I wanna try to highlight one observing program per month. And I picked a, a easy peasy one this month. This is the binocular Messier observing program, okay? So how do I get my bling for this? Well, what you do is you observe 50 or more Messier objects, okay? Well, Bruce, how the hell do I find those? And what are Messier objects? Well, guess what? The uh, Astronomical League has a guide to uh, Messier objects, okay? You can check that out here, okay? It is a whopping $8. I, I think you can handle it, okay? And they've got some uh, observing logs in the back of that, okay? So you observe 50 of these fine objects with your binoculars, 20 millimeter or 80 millimeter. And you don't need a big expensive telescope. You log the name of the object, the date and the time, the latitude and longitude, where you're living, an estimate of the seeing, the size and power of the binoculars, and perhaps a brief description of what you saw. Keep all those logs and you send it in to John Gore in Silverdale, Washington. And then you get bling. It's awesome. It's like merit badges for adults. Okay. So it's easy peasy. You don't need a big expensive telescope. So that concludes my astronomical league report just you know bruce i i did like 48 of them but i haven't done one in like over three years no time like the present i, I just haven't gotten the last couple <laughs> i just like yeah whatever. i tell myself i'm going to one of these days finish it okay. all right let's see now i gotta stop sharing how the hell do i do that uh, stop sharing all right i've stopped sharing Okay, that leads us into old business, which brings up the East Coast Star Party, which is going to be coming up next week. So, Bruce, you're back on. Oh, man. I got to talk a lot. <laughs> Where are you stopping, dude? You know, you're... <laughs> I, I'm sorry I'm not there. I had a long day at work today. So, anywho. Okay. So, um, back to this awesome website built by Sean Lozier sitting there uh, in the meeting tonight. So first of all, um, I, I really want to thank the committee uh, for the East Coast Star Party. We've been working on this for upwards of two years. Um, hopefully it's all going to come together uh, next week, the 14th, 15th, and 16th out at Chip Oak State Park. Um, this is the most awesome website. I put it in the chat, macbayastro.org slash ECSP. Okay, so the whole the whole schedule is there. Some pictures from the past star parties are there. Um, and hopefully we can uh, uh, recreate this awesome event that we uh, uh, did for almost uh, 22 years, actually 25 years up through 2018. Won't we'll go into the history of that for now, but um, we're gonna restart uh, in uh, 2023. And uh, long story short, the schedule is uh, right here. It, it starts on the 14th at 2 p.m. Okay, we got uh, check-in and then all night observing, free coffee all night. Uh, September 15th, Friday, the public observing night is 6 to 10 p.m. expertly coordinated with the Chip Oak staff by Mr. Sean Lozier. Uh, please note that the sunset is 715, but that's how it's gonna roll for that night and free coffee again all night. Uh, September 16th, uh, we have a, a cookout of, of fine uh, potluck items as well as burgers, dogs, and sodas. 
Um, we have $450 worth of raffle prizes that I ordered from Orion Telescope with uh, Rich's help. And uh, Sunday the 17th, the start party ends in the morning, okay? So um, I think, Rich, how many people we got registered now? Or Sean, about like 20? Close to 30. Close to 30, okay. Last time I looked at the the, the uh, spreadsheet that uh, Sean sent out, they're close to 30, 30 folks. So um, what I would ask <laughs> is your understanding. Uh, this is the first uh, uh, restart out of the gate of a, a fairly large event uh, for this club. Um, and uh, be flexible. Things are going to change. It might rain one night, big shock, but we're all amateur astronomers and we know how that goes. Okay. So anyhow, uh, come out, have fun. And uh, I really want to, you know, thank uh, Sean Lozier who has gone above and beyond to create this website. He's done the t-shirts. He's ordered cool uh, red lights to uh, highlight your path at night with a little rival of Staunton River Star Party, if you've ever been out to that. Um, uh, Rich has uh, dutifully paid all the bills, as you already mentioned. And uh, George has also assisted uh, with a lot of our pre-work for this to include two site visits with the uh, park staff out at Chip Oaks. Uh, <clears throat> we've had to expertly adapt to a lot of things uh, to uh, accommodate our RVs and our small trailers. And hopefully uh, we can uh, please most of the people most of the time. Okay. So, but again, I, I ask your uh, your flexibility and uh, hopefully we can have a good event and we'll, we'll pilot uh, how this runs and uh, see how it goes. Okay. All right. And are there any questions? I, we have a schedule that's posted online and everything you could possibly imagine has been uh, updated by Sean. Uh, I did get uh, uh, a message from Ray Moody that said, where are the updates? And, well, we're, we're updating the website. So um, are there any questions? I have a question. Why is sure. he coming out for this? Why is he driving from Colorado to East Coast Star Park? I, I don't know. I, I'm going to um, give Chuck some grief. Uh, I'll, 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 I'll try to, I'll try to see what I can do. No, no excuses. <laughs> I'm going to bring my drone out and we'll, we'll shoot some shots of, them, of set at least Thursday, Thursday night anyway. Okay. And hopefully there'll be a lot of participation and we'll get some stuff for the website. Okay. Let, let's just make sure that uh, we clear that with the park. Uh, we are, we are on state uh, park property. Uh, it, it may be a no drone zone that I don't know about, uh, but just well, let's please, uh, if we're gonna do anything outside of the normal box that you might think of, uh, let's make sure we clear that with the park staff. I'll make but sure. Th thank you for that offer. Is there a fee to get on the premises for the public part on Friday night? Um, I believe you, um pay like the standard parking parking fee of like seven bucks for like one night um yeah. when you come in yeah okay cars. that's it. it it's it's cheap bruce can you uh pull up the the location observing field or yeah a custom map for him i don't remember which website it's on <laughs> But is that it right there on the bottom? I think he, he's talking about do the observing field one. Yeah, this is the one that got updated. This is color coded. Yeah, that one. Yeah, let me uh, expand it a little bit. Yeah. Oh, full screen if you click that square in the top right corner. There you go. Look, we don't even need to send a millennial, man. He's he's handling it himself. <laughs> hey, man, I Discord, I Slack, I Teams, I Zoom, you name it. Hardcore, brother. What about X? I just wanted to point out, because there is a hurricane off the coast, close to this star party, 
that uh, you see the highlighted area in the bottom left there, right where you're circling. Yeah, that is the parking for the large campers if the field is wet. We don't know if it's going to be wet yet, but the little square up by the mansion is where you park if it's not wet. And we will find out because the park will tell us you're not going to park there that day. So just that's one thing you want to be flexible about with your trailer. And the other object is that yellow area is the regular parking lot. And that's all also available. Yeah, but not for trailers. Oh, for, for RVs though. Yeah. Well, that should have enough room in that other area, the secondary area for all the trailers to park. And they did say if it was over 20 feet, they were more concerned about the heavy trailers. So I guess if it's under 20 feet, they're not going to be concerned if it rains. We'll find out more, but just be flexible like Bruce. Yeah, this will be a learning experience. So we'll have a lot of lessons learned we can put into practice for next year. Yeah, we'll see what happens with the hurricane. <laughs> Jeff, you take care of that, okay? Okay, well, thank you very much, uh, Bruce. Is that it? Hey, can I ask a little bit about that 2 p.m. check in time? Um, for 30 people and setting up all the sites and stuff, uh, I'm, I'm not sure what time uh, the sun sets on that day, but is that really enough time? I mean, yes. So uh, local sunset in Surrey, Virginia, throughout this is going to be at 715. So is, is that is that enough time to get 30 people all checked in and sighted and all that? Find out. OK. <laughs> I don't think everyone's coming on Thursday, too. Some people are going to come Friday. OK. All right. You know, some people may show up Saturday. So there's, there's, there's been I'm a lot. Sorry. Go ahead. Let me ask a question about checking in on Friday. Um, do we just come to the same location and just check in with whomever yeah. at, at the site? Yes. Yeah. Find Bruce. Find Joel. Uh, yeah. Just same uh, same place, same location. Okay. And, uh, great. John Rapinski, what was your question? I was asking about the parking lot. Think that we normally park in the ship or the airport. That's available. Yeah. yeah. That's that yellow area. Yellow. Yeah. If you're if you're only going to come up for the day, that is where you should park. If you need to leave during the night and you don't want to flash your headlights and stuff, the rest of the yeah. astronomers, that's where you should park. Right. Right. Yeah, because then you should leave through the Chipotle Farm Road, away from the observing area. Okay, is that it? Hey, I might add, there's no hurricanes in Colorado. <laughs> <laughs> There's no East Coast Star Party in Colorado either, so boom. eat your heart out, Chuck. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'm hoping to go see the comet tomorrow morning. Me too. Well, if you're for you, it's going to be the little blue square there. Because you can do it next to your camper. Okay, so you just set up right there. The other highlighted area at the top there, Georgie pointed out, that's where everyone's going to camp. If you have a trailer under 20 feet or a tent. You're in that area because the field, the original area where we're going to be, the farmers got hay growing there and they will not be cut. Hmm. We're still growing hay. And so we, we had to move over. But that is a third, the square foot area, that highlighted area is like a third of the square mile. So it's pretty long and wide. Yeah. So there, we'll fit 30 people in there. And where are the campsites? The campground area? It's about a mile and a half down right. the road. Yeah. When you go take your shower, you're going to get your car off. Otherwise, you'll be hot and sweaty by the time you get back. Yeah. For those of you that are not familiar with Chip Oaks, um, this is the campground here in the upper yeah, left. Bro. The showers are there. Where we are. So you have to drive all the way around here to there. It's about a mile and a half. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it's, it won't kill you. Um, so <laughs> I'm going to be in the B loop here with my RV. So I'm going to. Uh, park here in the yellow square at, at night so I can drive away and I'm going to uh, set up my scope over here and trust somebody to watch it. Well, I was trying to get to the campground. I, I had to cancel my reservation. Two sites up in Bell Bay, sites 
Everybody hear that? Ron says the two sites at the campground have opened up today because somebody canceled. Yep. Yep. So if you want to check out reserveaparks.com, I'll, I'll put that in the chat as well when I get off the share. Okay. okay. Any other questions? All right. Thank you, Bruce. All right. Come on out. Have a great time. You can stop sharing now. There we go. Uh, Bruce mentioned bling. Speaking of bling, this is a pin that is available from the Night Sky Network for members of the club who participate in outreach throughout the year. And I've got a long list of people who participated last year. Uh, and I've given at least half of them, more, probably more than half to them. Others I have not seen. They they don't they're either on the peninsula or they never come. They're on Zoom. For instance, Roland Downing, this is your pin, but you can't get it on Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> but uh Tom Flatley, come get your pin. This is a nice one for James it's Webb. It's got the James Webb Space Telescope image on it. Thank you. Ooh, that's nice. What's that one for? Outreach. 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 George. Say it, yes. I got my pin. I took a at baseball. Oh, thank you. Okay, good. I'll check it off the list then. Thank right. you. Owen got his. And Tom got his. All right, good. Okay. Um, Very cool. Two things before we go to our teacher presentation tonight. Uh, I was remiss in getting together the door prize. I've got a really, really nice poster from NASA called the 3D Sun. And this is your door, door prize for tonight. Unfortunately, I forgot to bring the 3D glasses to view it with. So whoever wins the door prize tonight, I will get the glasses to you. <laughs> Red and blue 3D glasses. And the next thing is, there's a, a number of faces here that I do not recognize, and I'm sure some of you don't recognize. Let's go quickly, quickly around the room and loudly so we can all hear, I talk loud, introduce yourself, state your name, and one tidbit about yourself, starting with you. Jeff Goldstein, Vice President, retired Navy, retired uh, CPCC teacher. Sean Mosher, uh, amateur farmer. Commerce, <laughs> <laughs> treasurer, and amateur son. <laughs> Uh, David Schuldice, retired engineer, amateur astronomer. David Schuldice, okay, we're here. I remember this, yeah, probably made it to the 20th year. He comes out to almost every Skywatch, but uh, this is the first time I've seen it at a monthly meeting. Okay. Uh, I'm Madison DiGiulio. I'm currently an engineering major. I'll be switching to physics in a couple of years. Very good. Sam Bartholomew, who is a Silver Eclipse, Eclipse ambassador. ambassador, along with Jeff here. Okay. Uh, Eric Fagley. Eric Fagley. So I knew here in uh, Germany. And Eric, I don't think you signed the sheet. Oh, yeah, you did. Your second one on the list. Okay. Bill Bowers, a long time member of the Gen Active in the last couple of years. He's a medical student. Yeah. So let's see you back, Bill. And I'm Paul Suda, I'm an aircraft controller at NES of Canada, and I love astrophotography. So. Okay, Paul didn't sign the sheet. I'm ready, I'll just put on something. Okay, and we have Bill Rust and his wife. Yes, I my wife myself, she's a retired teacher. I love to teach long time. And I am a retired engineer, and I love astronomy, and I love to do something to pass along. Okay, and this is uh, Jeremy. Good evening, everybody. I'm Jeremy Mitchell, um, nearly retired Navy, and uh, one of uh, Bruce's co workers. You at the uh, Uh No, at the uh, Optic. All right, on this side, 
Richard Smith, retired Navy. Richard Smith. Richard Smith. No, finally, I try to do Sundays and I try to do the Dark Star. I just want to tell you. Yeah, Tom has been to many of the Garden Stars events. And I know this guy. Yeah, Jeff Edmondson, Chief Meteorologist at Wavy TV 10, and this is my second year in the club. Yeah, All right. Go oh, Wavy. John Weaver and one of the astrophysicists. John Weaver and his dad. Uh, hi, I'm Aaron Weaver, retired Navy, and uh, somehow I got a plug back college for this. Scholarship. Dave Fontaine, retired Navy, amateur astronomer, uh, first time to be uh, Great. Well, you can introduce your guest. Yep, Patrick Bartuli, um, flight security engineer, uh, been a member for a couple of years now. This is my son, Dylan Bartuli. He's at Plaza Middle School this year. Um, hoping he they can do some of the planetarium that they have over there. We'll see. Okay, and? Anna Colway, history and Anna Colway, who's also been very active. Okay. Uh, observing reports. Anybody? Hey, hold on. Anything? How about the rest of us? Oh, oh okay. <laughs> Introduce yourself, man. Oh, no. All right, fine. Ben Loyola, uh, scholarship committee. Uh, amateur astronomer, and an update on the RRT. Um, the first note was April 4th, Tuesday, that they were re-mirroring it, recoding the mirror, and uh, they were supposed to have finished end of May. So I, I've reached out to uh, uh, Jimmy Davidson. He is a research technical support scientist over at University of Virginia, and hope to hear back soon. I'll report back to the club. Thank you. Who else? Go ahead, Bruce. Hey, Bruce I, already introduced himself. We, we don't need to hear from Bruce. I, I, Bruce I, I've, I've, I've talked too much. I just want to say I'm the uh, president of the Chuck Jago fan club. So. <laughs> <laughs> you you go. got to learn how to pronounce it. It's Yago, not Jago. <laughs> okay, Chuck, well, introduce yourself. Chuck Jago, BBAA Northwest, Colorado. <laughs> Colorado. <laughs> and I'm happy that Robert is a fan. <laughs> okay, I'm Roland? his fan too. Oh. Roland, unmute yourself. Roland. Roland Downing. <laughs> and you're retired? Retired Navy, retired teacher. Very good. Okay. A lot of Navy, Navy folks all over the place. Who else? So oh, Kevin Brooks is not here. He just signed on. Who's <laughs> left the farmer? Les, who are you? That's me. <clears throat> um, Les Wilson, my name, been a club member since about uh, March. In fact, I just got up to go back out and uh, do a final look at the clouds. It looks like it's going to not be a good one. Last night I had a good run of data for the uh, fireworks galaxy. <laughs> Jonathan. I've been in the club uh, six years. Uh, I'd like to encourage people to post their observation reports, if, especially if they're doing visual astronomy. I really like reading the, reading those observation reports on Facebook. Um, I, I posted one. I know Ken posts his, and uh, I just like to encourage people to do that. I think it I think it helps others to get involved, maybe. Okay, and last but not least, iPhone, but that's Sandy Paxson. Sandy, unmute, your, unmute yourself and introduce yourself. So I'm faceless tonight. Sorry about that. Uh, so I'm Sandy Paxson, and I'm with uh, 13 News um, and have been a member of the club for about a year, year and a half now. Hey, thank you. Okay, so that's all. Awesome. We got a good group tonight. All right. Uh, any observing reports quickly before we get into our presentation? Bill. Something unusual during the first day of news of the uh, 3.30 in the morning, there was a bright object, horizontal, out facing northeast, um, left a trail, and uh, and then disintegrated at the end of its uh, uh, life. I didn't hear any noise, but it was unusual. Bill saw an unusual, face debris. An unusual event at the Perseid meteor shower about 3.30 in the morning. Yes, sir. 
Anybody hey, else? Uh, David. Uh, I'm from Colorado. I'm just here in the last year, and I do, do read for Mark Astronomy last Tuesday, and everybody else takes it for granted that we don't get the magnifications of Saturn that you guys do, especially at those altitudes. Really? I mean, it was up that high, and I was at my, I was at 350 power, and it was just lovely and solid. We, we get that a couple times a year. Well, I I had just assumed that Colorado was much better than here. It's it gets dark. Dark. And you you can get all kinds of dark stuff, but the mag because of the turbulence of the mountains. Oh, the turbulence the in the mountains. Um, it's all yeah, we have more still. Thanks for answering. Yeah, yeah. It's okay. The lack of humidity. Yeah, lack of humidity in the mountains in Colorado. Yeah, when I used to. Observe from Greenbrier, I could I could get that 18 inch up around three, four, five hundred power on a good night. I haven't had it over 250 looking at Saturn since I've been here. Wow, it's just not steady. Yeah. But deep sky is good. Yeah. Yeah. David came from Colorado. Chuck went to Colorado. So he traded. Traded. Okay. Anybody else? Making okay. president. I'm sorry. Did I talk over somebody? Well, I said make him a president. Sign him up. <laughs> That's next year. Next year. Yeah. Next year. Okay. All right. Well, our speaker tonight is uh, none other than Bill Rust, who is very big into astrophotography, astro imaging. And usually when he gives a presentation, it goes right over my head because I'm a visual astronomer. So I'm hoping that you will enjoy his uh, presentation tonight. Let me see if I can set it up here. Please do. Okay, I want to get the... It should be in that yeah. square. I wanna... oh, yeah, I'm going to share the screen. Go to that. Share and we can uh, maximize. I think Is that maximize. No, there's maximize. There we go. Okay, Bill, all yours. We talk loud. All right. Okay. Can you guys out in uh, video land hear me and see me? Can't see you, but they can hear. Okay, you. well, that's fine. Uh, I have been doing astronomy since I was like seven years old, and in those days I had a, a tube that I paid, I think, eight bucks for, and I earned my own money delivering papers and cutting lawns, and it, it stunk. It was terrible. But at any rate, time goes by, and I, I had a. I, when I got in the 80s, 1980s, I uh, I got a much more fancy scope, uh, and it was nice. But there's one thing that is absolutely essential if you're going to take uh, images of astronomical objects. You need to have your scope in alignment with the poles. And if you don't, you get... Uh, uh, trailing. And that is very, very annoying because you need the time to expose your photons and you don't need to see the star moving across the screen. And it's a fact, and I've come to understand that if you're using a guide star and it's displaced from your main prime focus and you're guiding this thing correctly and you're polar alignment is screwed up, you're going to generate a rotation in your field of view. And the closer you are having polar alignment, the less you're going to have a problem. So after spending several thousand dollars traveling around the country, uh, I guess I better go down these screens to see good stuff. Let me uh, let me start. 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 Start.
So what I did quickly. Space, space bar. Space bar. Yeah. So at any rate, this this kind of dawned on me after a long failure. I decided that I would do some research on this topic. And there's basically three kinds of ways you can align a telescope. And one is a hands-off automatic, which you know requires electronic gear. Uh, it's usually expensive. And I didn't want to do that. Not everybody can afford that stuff. And the uh, second kind is I, I, I bought myself a nice, expensive, fancy schmancy telescope mount assembly when I retired, thinking, you know, I was done. I All I have to do is put that out in the yard and voila, I'm going to get great images. Now, I didn't work out quite that way. My mount has a semi-automatic uh, find a star, line it up, do enough of them, and it tells you how far off you are. Uh, that's not all that accurate. And of course, the manual method is uh, the one I learned as I was coming along as old-fashioned drift map, where you physically look at a star near the meridian and a star in the east, and you adjust your altitude and your azimuth to make this the motion disappear. Well, that's not very accurate. In fact, I was using this little formula number one here, which is exactly correct if you happen to be on the uh, equator mm -hmm. and you happen to be uh, exactly uh, the star is directly overhead on the equator, zero deformation. And then you're supposed to, once you get that, you move over about an hour, two hours and a half, and you try the same thing with the uh, altitude. That's great if you bear in mind that you're going to get refraction at that latitude, uh, uh, roughly at that declination, roughly at uh, nine tenths of an arc minute. So you're automatically off. Didn't like that. So I decided I would do some hocus pocus for that. I came up with this formula and that still stuck. It was not good. It was off by at least 10% and it varied with the star's elevation. So the higher it was in the sky, the worse your uh, process was. So what I was trying to do was go back to square one and figure out the math or star motion. And uh, I wanted to study this model for clues as to how I could make this work better because it's really time intensive for me when I'm out there trying to stroke around with, with uh, aligning my telescope. And my telescope mountain and everything combined weighs about 250 pounds. Uh, so once you get it all assembled and this, the dirt won't support your tripod and it starts to you get a soft foot you just wasted half your night so i had to counteract that but that's another story <laughs> so so what i did was i created a model if, if you have a question feel, feel free to ask sorry this what kind of mount are you using i'm using a uh one of my comments were based on a tripod and a Celestron model uh, mount and Celestron telescope, 14 inch. And this thing was heavy. And it had little pointy feet that came down like, you know, supposed to stick in and not move. Well, it was not correct. It, is it Germany Tartario? Yes, it is. Certainly. Can you move the camera up? Oh, sorry. Am I in sight? No, I'm seeing your belly. I oh. can't see him, so I don't know. Yeah, move it up a little bit. More, more. There you go. Thank you. So I'm I'm good where I am. But anyway, it, it's a it's a it was a struggle, and I got tired of struggling. So I I went to the uh, astronomical almanac and got the uh, equations for the radius vector for stars, and then. What I did was I, I applied corrections to bring in error that was either an ast 
altitude or an as and built that into that expression. So after I had all that stuff, I simply uh, differentiated that expression, which means I found the velocity in terms of the uh, hour angle from the uh, expression for the radius vector. And voila, I had, well, didn't really have it. I thought I did, but I found out, uh, again, I needed to find the relative position because the stars move like crazy. And if you have two that are running together, you have to find the relative motion between the two. So you do that by subtracting one from the other. So, yay. Well, it didn't work. I realized after some thought that I was looking at the wrong thing. I have a telescope that is looking at things in two dimensions. It can't see anything that's coming down the barrel. And I have a three-dimensional vector equation. So I had to adjust that by rotating that vector into a, a direction so that the major axis going down the scope is out of sight. And I was only concerned about the other two, the vertical and east, west, and north, south. So that's, I hope I don't choke this talk. All right, at any rate, crank to crank. And I ended up with the left-hand side here is the position vector for any star in terms of outer angle, declination, observer's latitude, which you have to know, the uh, right essential. If you have a star and uh, you have a uh, guider, an off-axis guider, then uh, the right ascension displacement is, you know, if you move it around, it's either here, whatever that is in arc minutes, you put in that square. And the same goes for the declination. What's OAG? Stands for off-axis guider. And uh, if you don't have an off-axis guider, this is a bad idea. It doesn't work. The only way you can use this is if you have a something that's in parallel with your telescope. And if you don't have, if you've got a guide scope, you take the guide camera and you stick it in prime focus and you go for it. It works great. It's just another step you have to do, but it's easy enough to, to, to manage. So at any rate, I got all this, these variables here and I wanna track my star. So I have this function that has a known hour angle, the star, declination, the latitude is your at, and the other stuff is zero because you're looking straight at the star, the guide, the guide star, whatever it is you're trying to, to, to measure. And the variable, excuse me, the variables are the altitude error and the azimuth error. That's what you're looking for. Well, guess what? There's two of them. Remember in high school when you had a set of equations that x plus 2y equals 4? Well, you just can't solve that. you gotta got to know what one of them is. So I'm thinking, how am I going to do this? So I, uh, I made, while I was working on this stuff, I made graphs of the stars in a given position and watched their motion through out through time and I noticed that the coordinates were pretty much linear so that's pretty cool over a short range I mean I'm not talking from east to west I'm talking maybe uh, half a degree of the sky and I thought well maybe I can use that to my advantage if I can set up a plane where you have in terms of altitude, azimuth, and the drift rate, you can solve those because you can measure the drift rates for one or two stars and crank it into an equation and out pops your answer. You get automatically the altitude and the azimuth. So that's what I did and it worked. And uh, now I'm gonna try to discuss the actual process of putting this stuff together. Uh, first of all, there's a little math involved. So what I did was 
I created spreadsheets where you enter the variables you need, the hour angle, the uh, position coordinates for yourself, and for the, and the declination for the stock. And then you measure the individual uh, motion of the star you're looking at, whatever it might be. It could be Deneb, it could be Denebola, anything is, is in good sight. And uh, it's also very helpful to have a, a, a digital level and or a spirit level because you need to establish the vertical position for your scope when it's looking, when, you know, before you even start. This daytime, you're out there, you're setting up, you want the thing to be pointing straight up in the air when you expect it to be. That's what I went through, I skipped a little bit. Here we are again. Uh, if you don't do that, the math doesn't work out because when I derived all this good stuff, I said, surely I can get the telescope pointing straight up in the air. And so that's why it only has variables in terms of altitude and azimuth. So what's next? So at any rate, I found a, a shortcut. And uh, what I did was I, I used that level, the digital level, to measure the altitude of the, the telescope. And it saved about 20 minutes of alignment. So what I'm saying is, if you're at, uh, in my case, it would be 36.83. So if I put my digital level on the telescope while it's in the switch position and crank it to uh, until it reads uh, 36.83, I'm done. I've already solved for the altitude. It don't need that now. So, hey, I've only got one to go. So, let me see, what am I saying here? Okay. The There's one thing you can do after you're set out in the field. It's dark, you're looking at a star and you wanna, you wanna get your telescope aligned so that the uh, azimuth is correct. And you've already taken the uh, telescope and adjusted it so that the altitude of your telescope is on the money. So I'm gonna shift over to this image. This is a graph of what it looks like when you've got zero altitude error and at a typical latitude 30 degrees. If you can see on the uh, screen, I'm taking this time from one hour before transit to one hour after transit. And you can see that if you're exactly aligned, you have absolutely no deflection of the star whatsoever. And, and I picked two uh, uh, graphs here. One is where uh, the arc minute adrift is, is positive. That's at this line. You'll see it's almost flat. And this one's almost flat too. So if you, you look at a star and it starts to go in this way, and that's the south direction, then you simply adjust it by moving it to the west. And then you keep adjusting it until you don't need to adjust it anymore. And that's very helpful if you're doing this method or you just want to stop and watch the stars. There you go. You're good. Uh, you find that uh, it's more accurate to do the math but it's also very helpful if you don't have a huge error in the measurement of your um, uh, drift. Because if your drift is really huge, it's hard to, hard to figure out where it's going because it's going like that instead of like that. So that's why I put this on here. And frankly, if you're, if you're doing visual work, this is it. You're done. You probably could do this in 15 minutes tops. But the closer you get to that red line on the motion, the uh, 
longer it takes to see any motion. So you have a time limit. She will look at a star for five minutes and it's barely moving. Just call it good. You're, you're okay. So I wanted to put this to bed finally. So I figured out that uh, I would create a workbooks. And I call one of them two plane fix, and the other one is a drip regression. So what happens with these two uh, Excel spreadsheets I've cooked up is that uh, it gives you a, a chance to solve the two equations for the two stars uh, simultaneously. All I have to do is measure. So you get the data in for the first star, you measure its drift, you get the data for the second star, and you measure its drift. You crank the button, push, you're done. This is the altitude and the azimuth error. But the good thing is, if you do what I've just got through saying, the altitude is already set to zero. So I guess you guys are hopefully reading this stuff. It's a little dense, I'm afraid. So what, what I've tried to tell you is there's a lot of things that are going on up there when you do your uh, observations on drift. Uh, there's a lot of things that interfere with it. One is uh, refraction of the atmosphere, and the other is turbulence, which is also known as seeing. So what, what you have to do is I crafted this um, data regression sheet so that if you get data that looks like this, you can have a, a fit, a, a regression fit for the data, and it, it works quite nicely up to a point. Now, if it really is ugly out, your star is all over the place, you know, from turbulence. Now, as you say, if you're looking at... Um, what was the Saturn in Colorado? Mm -hmm. You know, you get the same thing here. The moisture and all the eddies and what have you screw up your observations, so it makes it a little difficult. As I'm going to say here, I just uh, ran past that one, but the point I'm trying to make is there are errors that are involved with this. One is refraction. If you use a short time interval, the refraction isn't real excuse me, isn't really a significant item. On the other hand, turbulence can be quite uh, daunting. So sometimes your data is useless with acute high turbulence. <clears throat> so at any rate, knowing that uh, I have uh, already fixed my telescope where the altitude error is zero, I can skip doing two stars and just do one. So let's see. I wanted to put this to the test on the 4th and 5th of May. I want to uh, check out, uh, you know, this method to make sure and we get this done ironclad. Everything was aligned correctly. Telescope point upwards in the vertical when it was set up, and so on. And uh, I I got the data, and I applied it, and a cloud bank moved in. And I was trying to redo this, you know, do it once, do it twice to prove it. You did it right the first time. Couldn't do that. So I redid it the following night. Fifth and the sixth. Uh, this time, I used the idea that my telescope was preset to the correct altitude for the North Star, not the North Star. And I fill in the data. And as you can see, uh, I used a nebula as my first uh, at about a half hour, hour angle. And I filled in the declination and my latitude. And the fact that it's north and south, I didn't like the idea of using uh, 
minus is in front of all of the arguments in the latitude column. So I just simply have made a, a multiplier of one for north and minus one for south. Now, as I said, you can use any stars you want. The two stars need to be about an hour and a half apart, maybe two. Because if you remember, if you uh, have two parallel lines or close to parallel, you know, you don't get great accuracy when you're trying to find trying to find the intersection of those uh, two lines. What you need is lines that are like this. So when they cross, you have a good idea. So you have one that's set up at close to uh, an hour of near the transit, and one that's about maybe an hour and a half away, and they'll give you an intersection that's, that you can rely on. That's exactly what I did. Well, in this case, I used the fact that uh, my telescope was already aligned to my latitude. And I selected a, an hour and a half <laughs> hour angle. It doesn't make any difference because I made all this up. And then what I do is I pick this north-south observation drift at minus one arc second per minute. One tenth of arc second, I said. And I keep I that, fiddle with it. Point yes. that screen doesn't help. Point to that screen. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> this this data here, I I selected to be minus point one. The reason I picked that is I wanted the altitude error to be zero. And if it's off this, it's going to be something else. So I simply did a <clears throat> hunt and peck about three or four iterations until I've stumbled across minus point zero zero point one. It gave me this result. It gave me this altitude error and percentage of turn and an azimuth error of 0.6%. I did not change that telescope, period. It stayed put. That's as good as you can get. I can't possibly adjust those screws any better than that. And that very night, I, I took uh, two images. One is M13. I measured the flatness. And each one of these is only 45 minutes, so five minutes exposure each uh, for each exposure. I think that comes out to nine exposures. All of the, uh, the average of all of the errors of the flatness was 0.22 for this big image. And for this image, which is uh, one and a half magnitudes fainter, came out to 0 0.10 is flat. That's all I did. To <coughs> I got it on a guide stone and I got rid of the tracking error that would be induced in this image because in incorrect polar alignment. Believe me, if it had been off by three or four arc seconds in five minutes, I would have had tracks that would look like that. And then you have to go through a bunch of uh, direction hocus pocus when you're trying to uh, get the images to look like, you know, you knew what you were doing. So this was really, you can even see, a, I think I had an airplane go through on that particular image. But I did nothing to these to improve the stretch. Uh, I stretched it a little bit, but I did nothing as far as any kind of uh, electronic tweaking. This is right out of the box. So, uh, uh, anybody have any questions? I hope I didn't. What what mirror? What's that? <laughs> <laughs> All right. She has bugged me for years to do something besides set up my telescope. So I did. The upside was 
I still had the same problems with guiding. The downside, the, the downside was that. The upside was that I had an opportunity to get continuity between one of one event, the next test, and so on down the line. Until, you know, this is not obvious. This is certainly not obvious what I just presented. And all it takes is a spreadsheet that I worked up that I'll give you, and another spreadsheet that will measure the uh, put in the data measurements for. Uh, the regression of your uh, whatever it is you're tracking and voila it's a little bit of busy work I didn't write a professional spreadsheet here you know I have to cut and paste but my spreadsheets also contain alignment stars in various positions and the bright stars all the name bright stars <clears throat> so that's helpful they don't have to go rooting through a, a, a some kind of manual the star chart, sir. Yeah, so so I get you're calculating, I guess, the error of your alignment. Right, exactly. So, so then by setting up your telescope, yes, setting up your mount, and then applying the correction, how, how do you go about doing that? Aha, uh -huh. that's easy but not easy. Each each uh, wheel has a screw thread on it, all right? What you have to do is you have to calibrate or not character, you have to characterize your mount. So you have to know how many turns will move your mount in altitude, say one degree, and how many turns it will move this way, let's say one degree is a lot, but say <clears throat> half of it. And the way I did that was because I, I can, I, I, I made these uh, wheels, they're snap ons for the altitude and the asthma adjustment wheels. But you don't need that. You can use a piece of tape. You use a piece of tape. You take tape around the circumference of the wheel. You put your uh, level on top of the telescope, and you adjust it to say say you're at uh, 35 degrees latitude. Adjust it to 35 degrees and, and mark your tape, and then twist it the wheel until it gives you 30 seconds, and then you measure how far it went around. If it went around one turn or 0.9 turns or 1.1 turn or whatever it happens to be, then you divide that into the, the, the number of turns per degree or arc minute, if you would. And in my case, it's for the altitude, it's 54.4 arc minutes per turn. So I crank that thing one time, I advance it. 54.4 arc minutes. And the same basic thing is in my equipment for the azimuth, it so happens that it's 27.8, which is almost exactly half the other one. So you do the same thing. You can take a piece of tape. You have to measure how far away your adjustment screws are from the center of axis of your mount so that when it twists, say it's four inches. And say you, you, you measure the threads, if there's 24 uh, threads per inch, you get a ruler, you, you have a thread, thread gauge, it's helpful, but if you don't, you just do the uh, ruler and threads. So you know, in my case, it's about 24. So I have 24 threads per inch. Okay, so that means I'm 1 24th of an inch for each turn. You divide that by four, and that gives you the tangent of the angle, whatever it is. In my case, it would be one turn is equivalent to 27.8 arc minutes. And you're done. So that, that number 
You know, remember there's an approximation. When the sine of the angle and the tangent of the angle, the small angles, is equal to the angle, but it's in radians. So when you want to convert it to your radians into uh, uh, arc minutes, you have to multiply by 180, divide by pi, and then times 16. That's a pound. So you do a rough alignment, or you do a line on your color alignment, just go to do the calculation, put your error, and then adjust your scope in your line. Exactly. The, uh, there's other uh, people. Uh, PhD2 has a, a thing where it's similar, but you don't have to measure it. Uh, but I don't use that. I, I do this way because I, uh, I'm trying to hone the thing, and I've honed it down. To, after you do the initial setup in the daytime, you know, you're going to set up anything. Uh, so it takes an extra half hour to do the alignments, make sure everything is still set. And when it gets ready for starting to see uh, view stars, it takes about half an hour to do the whole process. Instead of like two hours for me when I was trying to do the old fashioned. I'm telling you, that was, I killed me. And uh, so that's why I came up with this. And I hope that it's, not clear as much. <laughs> Thank you very much. Why don't you put your put your email address on the board here, so okay. if anybody wants to get that, what's your what's your email address? Will Rice. If you want his information, his Red Kate's workbooks. That's the address. Thank you. I'm going to pull my, uh, my, uh, hang on, wait, not yet. You gotta, gotta end that. Not to close it. Not to, uh, where's these things right there? Reject it. Yep. Okay, pull it out. Thank you, Bill. That was very interesting. I can tell you're an engineer. Well, <laughs> I decided to do something with that education. <laughs> and it makes me more, a, a presentation like that makes me glad I'm a visual astronomer. My computer, if anybody wants to see some of the software in real time. When I, when I have people explaining what they do for astrophotography, it makes me glad that I'm a visual observer. I will be happy to look at their pretty pictures. Okay. Uh, your prize. All right. Yeah, shake up these tickets. Did everybody get a ticket? Everybody get the call in tickets? There, I'll give you uh yeah, you have that since you take it. You have that's the winner. Okay, I'm checking them up real good. Sam, would you want the big eye ticket? Okay, the number is the last three, six, six, five. That's me. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you get a beautiful poster and I'll make sure you get a couple pairs of 3D glass. The solar glasses <laughs> don't work. <laughs> Speaking of which, Paul, did you get, were you able to sell any of the solar glasses on base? So I'm trying to for the air show. I'll oh, set up a little area for the air show. Uh -huh. And then hopefully tonight we can sell them all off. Okay. If anybody wants solar glasses to take and sell, we've reduced the price from $2 to $1. Okay. So <laughs> I had uh, about, I sold about four of them at uh, Saturday, Sunday, last Saturday. And at last Sky Watch, I sold. About a dozen. Yeah, I think maybe 20. Mm -hmm. So it was it really, it really worked out good. So I got packages of about 25. If you want to take some to sell, just make sure that the money gets back here because it goes to the back rims that are working. 501c3 scientific and educational organization. And if people want to uh, 
get a tax deduction, they can write it off. Also, I have good. You want a t-shirt, I've got some extra large blue, extra large gray, two, one, two XL gray, a couple medium grays, medium blue, the small blues, the small gray. So if you, uh, we're selling these for $15 each, and uh, if you want one, see me afterward. Hey, George. Yeah. Comments or questions? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. we should have uh, Bill show, do a little uh, home observatory presentation. I saw some uh, pretty neat things there. Oh, okay. Good, good. Not as fancy as yours, though. <laughs> yeah, I know, but uh, still, I thought, hey, I'm intrigued. I want to see more. I saw <laughs> the bottom part of your, your, your mount there, equatorial, so. Another engineer here. <laughs> okay, any other questions, comments? David. I had a question earlier. Just coming from Colorado, where there's no humidity, um, I had trouble at the uh, boardwalk astronomy um, fogging up my telegraph. And I was wondering, when I'm, as a swimmer, I've just got some um, anti-fogging lights that I put on my glasses. Why wouldn't that work? Why, why does everybody opt for the heat? Would, would anti-fogging material, what's it, what's it called, a wipe? Uh, yeah. Would it work on a telegraph? Does anybody know? Um, have they have, they, yeah, I, I uh, modified mine in two ways on my home observatory. First one is I put the, the uh, blinker circuitry in there. It's, I think it's like 20 something bucks online. Um, well worth it. Well worth it versus just the dimming uh, control that it comes with normally. And then the other thing to do is buy the little heat kit. It's just a couple of little resistors that get mounted and it just gives us just enough heat um, uh, to keep that uh, the the 50% uh, see-through glass, but it's actually a partial mirror there. Um, it works great too. So two little kits, it's an add-on and uh, relatively inexpensive, encourage you to modify it. Yes, most of the time we hear about dew heaters. I've never uh, heard about the, uh, the wipes here. Ron, did you have a question? Anybody else? Nobody's had that uh, uh, experience with the uh, the wipes. So did you try it out? Give it a try and see if it works. I was just wondering if anybody else had because whenever you look online, everybody's offering heaters or cards. I mean, for the telegram, I guess it should work, but I don't think anyone wants to look. Use it on their eyepieces. Of course not. No, he knows that. No, wouldn't you wouldn't use it on your eyepieces or your so then you'd still be stuck on making the dew heater anyway. Well there, so I guess it's just as easy to make it for one more thing and hook it on your tell <laughs> I've got a dog, so it doesn't talk too much. My I I keep my eyepieces in my pocket, so they're oh, okay. so I'm I'm usually okay. Very good. Okay. So All right. I'll warn you though, when you come to Sky Watch. But they will tell when you're not okay there. It's gonna happen. Sometimes it's very wet. Yeah, sometimes it gets almost like a filling like of rain in there. Yeah. It's fine. Yeah, it happens when it slips. Yes, it does. <laughs> so, uh, what I usually do is I'll have my piece, like you said, and I'll just have to swap it out. Yeah. You fog that one and put a different yeah. one in. Yeah. If I forget my duty. <laughs> well, we are looking forward to the East Coast Star Party next week. That should be a lot of fun and uh, a learning experience for all of us. So it is now 9.04, according to that clock. Meeting adjourned. Very good, Julie. <laughs>